My former senior pastor, Dr. Reverend William Wan, used to pastor a church in Washington, D.C. He had several children, including a daughter, who was a straight A student, attending the best school in D.C. Uh, but when she reached her teenage years, almost overnight, something changed. You know, she started to become every parent's worst nightmare. She started wearing black lipstick, shaved half her head bald, uh, the rest of her hair, she spiked it and dyed in ro rainbow colors, uh, started her years with all kinds of rings. She started smoking, experimenting drugs, sex, locked herself in the bedroom, and uh, started skipping school. Of course, her grades plummeted. Her parents were very, very concerned. They tried very hard to reach out to her, but to no avail. But worse was yet to come. One bright sunny morning, she came down with a packed bag, and told the parents that today I'm 16. The law says that I don't have to live with you anymore. So I'm going to move to Canada. Can you please fetch me to the bus station? Happy birthday, you know. And uh, well, they strenuously pleaded with her not to do it, but they could not. And so for the next three years, she lived in Canada on her own, you know, really struggling, making just enough money to survive, refusing her parents' offer to help or, or, or you know, their invitation to come back. And then one day at 19, she called Pastor William one and said that she was five months pregnant. And could he please come and marry her and you know, the father? And he said that was the most, the weirdest wedding he had ever officiated at. It was some house and uh, all the people, all the guests who attended the wedding, they were all teenagers, they were all high on drugs. Well, the wedding didn't last long. After three years, you know, uh, it, it, it came to an end. Uh, and uh, left with a baby to raise on her own, she finally came to her senses. And she realized that her life was totally dysfunctional. Uh, she reconciled the parents. She admitted that she, they, they were right. She was wrong. And she went back to school for the sake of her son. Eventually, she earned herself a PhD, and today she is teaching as a professor in a Canada university. Now, though the story has a happy ending, it was a very agonizing experience. Uh, when she left, she told the parents, and she kept telling the parents, you know, it's not about uh, you. You are good parents. It's all about me. It's I, I just need to find my own space. I just need to discover myself. I just need to go and do this for me. And it illustrates an issue I want, to illustr uh, I want to talk about today. We've explored different facets of individualism. Uh, we'll talk about the relationship between God and me. Okay? Am I just uh, somebody who is autonomous, doing whatever I, I, I wish, whatever I want, or am I someone under authority, uh, created by uh, a higher being who calls the shots in my life? Important question, right? And then we'll talk about the relationship between the community and me. To what extent do I do what I, I want? Uh, to what extent do I have to flow along with everybody else and uh, live my life for other people? Today, I want to go to the heart of individualism. I want to talk about a concept, how we form a concept of ourselves. In other words, I want to talk about our identity. What is identity? What's well, a complex kind of abstract con uh, concept, but I think it, it combines several ideas. First of all, our identity is the core of who we really are. Okay, the basic, the, the essentials of who, uh, our values, our, 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 our thoughts, ourselves, uh, our concept of ourselves, that does not change from situation to situation. Okay? That remains constant through different circumstances. The essentials of who we really are deep down inside. Secondly, uh, our identity has to do with our sense of worth. What gives my life meaning and significance? What makes me a valuable person? What makes me somebody rather than nobody? And finally, I think our identity is about, has to do with our aspirations and our dreams. What is my life supposed to be about? What am I supposed to be doing so that I can flourish, so that I can reach my full potential, so that I can ex uh, enjoy maximum satisfaction as a person? Where am I what, where I'm supposed to be hated to and do what I'm supposed to do in my life? Our aspirations and our dreams. And so I think our identity combines these various concepts together to form a picture of our self-concept of who I really am. And I'm sure you agree that these are extremely profound concepts and yet they're intensely practical because 
These are questions we ask ourselves all the time about ourselves, right? And these things are what really drive us every day. The decisions that we make, the way we think, the way we relate to people, the way we live our life is driven or is shaped very much by our concept of our identity. And uh, regardless of whether you're Christian or not, this is true. And so this is something that uh, I think we are all intensely interested in. Now, some of you might have already noticed that the passage in the sermon outline today was one that I preached on recently in my uh, series on idolatry. So, but I have, uh, I've considered and prayed hard about this. I've considered many other possible passages, but in the end, I concluded that this is still the one that is most on point. So we're going to look at it again, but we're going to come at it from a different perspective and ask ourselves what it teaches us about our identity. So let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. If someone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rub garbage that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now, a long passage, and it contains lots of things that sound, especially the first part, contain lots of things that seem very alien to us. But I think once we understand the context, okay, the historical and cultural context, you will see that what Paul says here is highly relevant to us. It is highly relevant to us in our cultural moment. And it just thinks there's something very special about the generation we live in because uh, most of us, our parents, actually come from a rather traditional culture. Okay, traditional culture. But we, because of our education, we are very exposed to modern Western culture. And most of us, actually, we find ourselves caught somewhere in between. Okay? And it's to do very much with the issue of our identity. So who are we really? Okay? In this, this uh, uh, cultural tension that we exist in. I think this, this passage uh, addresses three concepts that has to do with our identity. Number one, uh, they are, number one, the programming of our identity. Number two, the problems with an achieved identity. And number three, the provision of a better identity. Okay, this is what the three things I want to talk about today. Number one, the programming of our identity. Number two, the problems with an achieved identity. And number three, the provision of a better identity. So let's get started. Number one, the programming of our identity. Paul was writing to a church that he had planted, made up mostly of non-Jews, which the Bible called Gentiles. The problem was that some Jewish teachers had come along and taught them that uh, in all, they, they're not true Christian believers yet. They could not be truly saved by God. They were not real Christians unless and until they also adopted the Jewish way of life since Christianity came out of the Jewish religion. Okay, all the original Christians were Jews and really uh, it was the understanding of the Jewish religion uh, that, that Christianity was the fulfillment of the Jewish religion. And since Christianity came out of the Jewish religion, they argued that you had, those teachers argued that you had to culturally convert, not just spiritually convert, but culturally convert to the Jewish way of life as well if you want to be saved. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to be accepted by God, it's not just enough to believe in Jesus Christ. You must become a Jew. Live like a Jew as well. Now, in particular, they argued that all male Gentile converts had to be circumcised. Because uh, that was something that Jewish men took great pride in. It was something that they felt distinguished them from other people around them. It was what set them apart as God's specially chosen people because that was the thing that he told their forefathers Abraham to do long ago to identify themselves as the Jewish people that God were going to bless. 
So if Gentiles wanted to be saved, well, possible, we can make a concession for them. But apart from trusting in Jesus Christ, they also had to be circumcised as well. In other words, they had to adopt a holy Jewish identity. And in refuting them, Paul's argument was basically that, look, if being saved is dependent on having a Jewish identity, then he had far more impressive cred credentials than anybody else. He was the consummate Jew. He was more Jewish than all these false teachers who were teaching them. And if you understand that, then what he says begins to make sense. Huh? We go back to verses 4 to 6 with the context. Now, you understand what he's saying. He says, if somebody else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more than all these other false teachers. Circumcised on the day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew Hebrews, regard the law of Pharisees, was he persecuting the church of righteousness based on the law of faultless? What is Paul talking about? He's giving his credentials as a Jew. He said, okay, if Jewish identity is what saves you, I have a more Jewish identity than anybody else. If you look at it, he talked six things about himself. The first three had to do with his pedigree. He was a thoroughbred. He was born a Jew, raised as a Jew, circumcised according to the loose laws uh, for, for Jews. So, no, he had the perfect pedigree. The second three, okay, I can't go into the details, but he had to do with his performance as a Jew. Okay, Paul is saying that he did more for the Jewish faith, the Jewish nation, the Jewish race than any of these people. Uh, he had done more than anybody else to uphold ethnic purity and to defend the Jewish religion, especially against the rising, the new Christian, no, no, the, the, the new faith that had arisen, that sprung out of Judaism and was the, you know, considered to be a deviation from it. He had done more than anybody else to stamp it out, to try and stamp it out, to defend the purity of the Jewish race and religion. In fact, on a separate occasion, he said this. Uh, to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 4, he said, The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time. He's famous and they can testify if they are willing that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion living as a Pharisee. Okay, the Pharisees were a group of people, a sect that, arose, you know, that came into existence after the Jewish nation was conquered and it, you know, the, the, all kinds of influences threatened the purity of the Jewish faith and race and the Pharisees, the people who rose up to insist that uh, no, the, the Jews must remain pure and must keep the laws of God and Paul said that that's the sect I belong to. His point was that I'm a more accomplished Jew than any of the false teachers. If being Jewish is what saves people from God's eyes, they have more merit than any of them. But I have come to realize that that identity, the Jewish identity, is not what we need. It's not what saves us. What Paul said gives us very interesting insight into the establishment of our identity. You see, all traditional cultures, it's not just Paul's culture, all traditional cultures teach people to establish their identity by conforming to the roles assigned to them and fulfilling the obligations that came along with those roles. You don't earn recognition. You know, in, in, in traditional societies, you don't earn recognition, you don't derive satisfaction, but primarily through your unique achievements. People don't have aspirations as individuals. They don't dream about doing something different uh, you know, from, from what their parents did. They don't strike out and blaze their own trail, do their own thing, break the mold. Because in their culture, personal honour was not important. Rather, you, need, you gain honour collectively through your community, whether it's through your family, maybe as a soldier, through the regiment that you belong to, and through uh, the, the, the nation or the race that you belong to. The concept is that everyone, is, everyone subordinates their individuality for the community. Okay? And together as a community, that's how you gain recognition. That is who you are. That is how you should understand yourself. That is how you should live your life. That's your identity. Now, modern societies, modern Western culture, uh, which we are highly exposed to, has gone, swung all the way to the other extreme. Today's cultural message regarding your identity is this. Okay? You, you will not hear it directly being put into these propositions like what I'm doing to you, but this is the message that's constantly being drummed into all our heads. 
Today's cultural message regarding identity is this. You need to break free from tradition, institution, authority, and other people's expectations. Instead, you need to dig deep within your own heart, search yourself to discover the real you. Moreover, you find significance and worth by doing whatever it takes to follow your dreams. You gain recognition and honour not by conforming to convention and playing a side role, but by being a self-made person. Don't do something just because people want you to do it or tell you to do it. Don't do something just because your parents desire it of you. Do it only if it is really who you are and what you want. That's what culture pushes aggressively. Just consider so many of the Disney movies, for example, which actually, if you think about them, they, are, they all share the same theme. They are all about breaking free, discovering a whole new world for yourself, right? You, I mean, come on. If you just think about it, you find the same theme in Little Mermaid, okay, in my generation, Ratatouille, a bit older, I mean, younger, Mulan, Moana, Frozen, Aladdin. And you know something, what I find increasingly irritated by is that in almost more and more in all these Disney movies, tradition, unenlightened, rigid tradition is represented by, you know who? By the father. Huh? By the father, right? I mean, it's all, now, now, now tradition is negatively portrayed as a narrow-minded, uh, overbearing and controlling father who tries to stop his children and usually it's the daughters, huh? who try to stop his children from fulfilling their personal dreams. Okay, it's not just Disney also. Remember the movie Cruits? Did you watch the movie Cruits? Right? The, father is, the family lives in this cave. And they live in a cave because the father is, he is just in his mind, that's the only safe place to be. Don't venture out there into the world. And then when the daughter ventures out there into the world, you know, he stamps, you know, he puts his foot down, no, then don't go and discover, don't go and explore. Just do it because this is the way it has always been done. It's the same theme that runs throughout all these movies. You know, it used to be that the, the bad guys used to be the evil stepmothers, right? Now the bad guys are <laughs> the rigid, clueless, and unenlightened fathers. And wow, recently I watched, you know, uh, with Shang-Chi, the, the, they, they, they have reach a new law. Not only uh, is the father old-fashioned and authoritarian, now he's demonized as well. <laughs> now, my point is that all cultures prescribe a way by which people ought to establish their identities. No, it, they don't say in so many words. You're not going to read a manual and tell you this is step one, two, three, four, five, how you establish your identity, but it's always presented in a very subtle and yet very... Uh, uh, kind of taken for granted way. Everybody knows it. You know? This is the way it ought to be done. Traditional cultures tell people to find their identity through conformity and fulfilling their obligations, whereas modern Western culture tell people find their identity by breaking the mold and expressing yourself freely. And I just want to say, especially to those of you who are Christians, now this is so relevant because we come to church we read the Bible, we listen to messages, and yet at the same time, we are bombarded non-stop by the world's messages on culture, how we view ourselves, and uh, th th this has serious implications because it is very possible for us to have a very superficial Christian kind of faith, subscribe mentally, uh, intellectually to, 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 to the teachings of the Bible, but actually our identities are thoroughly being shaped by the world, what the world tells us. Okay, the way we look at ourselves, and it has implications also, powerful implications for the way we look at other people and relate to them as well. Okay, it becomes so obvious to me when I talk to many young people and they have this concept. Now, there's this concept, okay, people should be left alone. Don't go and track whether they are doing their quiet time or not. Where do you think that came from? Okay, if they want to do it, then... They will do it. Meaning, if they look deep inside themselves, this is really what I want to be, I will grow in my faith, this is the person I'm supposed to be, then I will do it. But you shouldn't go and tell people. You know, ask, are you doing your quiet time? Ask people to fill in forms, ask people to check in a WhatsApp group. It is offensive you know, to the younger generation. Where do you think that came from? 
all, now more and more, I find uh, people are saying we shouldn't preach the gospel to people. Yeah. We shouldn't impose our Christian views on other people. If they want to become Christians, it must be something that they search deep within their own hearts. And they must find for themselves that this is who I am, this is who I want to be, and come to their own conclusions. But we should not be the ones to impose this on them. See what I mean? We are superficially Christian. Okay? We say, well, salvation is a good thing, people are going to hell without God, but we are thoroughly immersed in our culture and corrupted by our culture. And we, we, we take on all the values and thinking of our culture you know, without discernment. The irony, of course, is that even if we choose the way of modern culture, we are all still being programmed. We may think we are acting freely, being ourselves, but actually we are just doing what our culture prescribes, pressures and pushes us to do all the time. And more importantly, even the modern way, you know, it may feel attractive to us because it sounds like this is freedom. The truth is both whether traditional culture, modern culture, both ways of establishing the, uh, uh, an identity, both have lots of problems. Let's take a look at some of this. Point number two. Okay, the problem with uh, an achieved identity. Now, the Apostle Paul uses the term confidence in the flesh to describe his former identity. And here he's engaging in a play of words. Okay, when he says confidence in the flesh, he's engaging in a play of words. There's double meaning here. First of all, he's, he's mocking the people who say that you need to be circumcised to be saved because circumcision is a literal cutting of the flesh. But more generally, by right, confidence in the flesh, he meant reliance on human effort. Trying to achieve something in our strength by our efforts. And Paul was writing this because he was rejecting the idea of earning acceptance by God through your own performance. We have, we have talked about two different approaches to establishing identity, the traditional way and the modern way. Now, they appear to be opposites, but actually, they share something in common. What is it? In both cultures, you have to work to live up to people's expectations. It's obvious in traditional cultures. In traditional cultures, you achieve your identity by working hard to fit in. But actually, the same is true in modern culture. In modern culture, you achieve identity by working hard to stand out. And this need to perform for your identity creates many problems. Let's just examine three of them. Number one, the truth is we all need people to approve of us. Yeah, modern culture says that no, you, you, you just have to be happy with yourself. Okay? But deep down inside, we know that it's not true. It is not enough for us to approve of ourselves. Your self-praise, your, your, your self-acceptance okay, is no big deal. What you really need is the praise and affirmation and acceptance of other people. You know, there are so many people. They go on the uh, social media and then they post uh, about their rejection by other people. They've been rejected by the boyfriend, rejected by the girlfriend, rejected by the parents, rejected by the church leaders. And then, you know what they say? Lah? They say, but it's okay, I'm fine. Because I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people think. I care about what I think about me. And it doesn't matter. Okay, so long as I'm being me. Why do you think they post those, make those posts on social media? What, what is their hope? They're hoping that people will endorse what they say, will like what they say. They are, in their dreams, or their, their greatest dream is that their, their posts will become viral. Thousands of people will join and say, yeah, yeah, you know, just be yourself, you do you, heck care what people think, you've got to be yourself, you know, break out the mall. Can't you see what's really happening here? What's really happening is they haven't been liberated by, for the need for approval at all. All that has, ha has happened is, all that they've done is to change the group of people they look to for affirmation. Right? They've just switched to a new group of cheerleaders. But we all need cheerleaders in our life. That's the way we were created. We can't run away from that. We can't validate ourselves. We need others to tell us that we are good, that we are worthy, that we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are loved, that we are not just a waste of oxygen and food. Modern individualism doesn't take that need away at all. 
It just puts it into a different guise. That's all. Secondly, why it seems that modern individualism frees you from people's expectations, that is purely an illusion. You know, I've talked to many young people, and they have, they, 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 one of the biggest dreams they have is that they can be their own bosses. Don't have to go and work for other people. Okay, start their own businesses, be entrepreneurs. Their heroes are Mark Zuckerberg, more lately, uh, Elon Musk. And my question to them always is, what made you think that it is desirable? What gave you the idea that it is desirable to be rich, to be famous, to be a self-made person? Where did that come from? Do you think you really dug deep within your heart and say, okay, this is what I really want. This is who I am as a person. This is how I find myself. This is original. Come on, guys. There are thousands of people who are dreaming the same dreams as you. You think it, you're original? You think it came up from your own heart? Of course not. There are plenty of people dreaming the same dream, and the reason is obvious. It's because our culture has prescribed for you what is desirable in our day and age. Our culture gives you, tells you, be free, you know, decide for yourself, but it gives you a greed, a filter through which, you know, uh, to, to decide what are the qualities that will really be admired and significant. One other way, huh? another way to think of this is just take the example, okay, of parents and daughters. Okay, many of you are parents, teenage daughters. Okay, one of the issues that will almost invariably come up is the issue of how to dress. Right? The parents very often will feel that Okay, your dressing is too revealing. Right? It's too flamboyant, it's too revealing. And how do daughters respond? Ah, oh, you're old-fashioned, you're rigid. What do you think really the issue is? The daughters think that it is about freedom, being real you. Okay? Your parents, this is who they are. Me, this is who I am. This is the way I want to be. This is the way I ought to dress. This is, I have to be true to myself. Freedom from external uh, expectations and people imposing their, their rules on me. You know, that's, that's deception. And that's clearly deception. Because if you buy into the idea of freedom, all that would happen is that culture, meaning another group of people, would be imposing their values and expectations on you. Where do you think you get those ideas that you need to wear skimpy clothes, dress in a revealing way to be yourself? You think you came up with that? No, of course not. It came to you through culture, through the media, through social media, through the movies, through, you know, People around you, they are defining you. You didn't come with yourself. You're not being true to yourself. You are just doing what other people want so that you can have their approval. That's all. Okay, I'm not saying this is the right way to dress or this is the wrong way to dress, but at least be honest enough and self-aware enough to understand that this is deception. You're not being free. You're not being yourself. Because... Every culture, whether it's traditional culture, modern cultures, they all do that. They give you a greed that forces all, you know, by which you evaluate everything, and then they'll tell you what is good, what is desirable, what is the kind of person you need to be so that you will be accepted by other people, you'll be thought of as being cool, accomplished. You are just living up to other people's expectations. Either way. Thirdly, an achieved identity creates overwhelming stress. It's really a bad way to live and a prescription for mental problems. It is why so many of you are so tired so much of the time. You see, under the traditional system, yes, you, are, you, you do have a pressure to conform, but at least the roles are clearly defined. You know what you're supposed to do. And because these are traditional roles that have been carried out thousands of years, more or less you know how you need to go about meeting your obligations. It's very stifling, right? It, it, it involves a lot of self-denial. It's very stifling, but modern individualism is far, far worse because now you are free, so-called. You need to go and figure out for yourself who you really are, what you ought to be doing with your life. And then you, you, you figure something, you, you try it out, you try to work it out. When it fails, you're a hopeless failure. And if it succeeds, you feel good. You feel a sense of accomplishment. You think people now accept you. But you know what's going to happen? You're going to feel tremendous pressure. They to keep it up 
so that you can continue to be endorsed by people. It's a crushing kind of pressure. Take one biblical example, the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Peter. Okay? Peter thought that he understood himself, who he really was. And when Jesus one night said that all of them, his disciples, would betray him in his greatest hour of need. You know how Peter responded? This is what he said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. He said, Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I, I never will. I'm different. I know myself. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. Peter thought he knows better. He said, Even if I had to die with you, I will never disown you. And then all the other disciples, no choice, say the same thing. Right? Peter said, We also got to join in. Okay? That's how culture works, eh? We know, we know what happened, of course, that night. After Jesus was arrested and people identified Peter, you know, people started identifying Peter as well. Jesus, the disciples, little slave girls came along and said, Hey, yeah, with Jesus. He vehemently denied it with swearing and curses. He denied Jesus. And Matthew chapter 26. 75 says this, Then Peter remembered the word Jesus has spoken before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he was crushed. He went outside and wept bitterly. You know what was happening to Peter? This is called an identity crisis. Really. Peter felt harder than everybody else. And that's the problem when you have an achieved identity, an identity that you work for. Have you ever wept bitterly? Have you not wept bitterly before? Because you could not live up, you could not keep up with the identity that you have tried to achieve for yourself. Who you thought you are, who you thought you need to be, and you fail. You, you couldn't meet up to it, or you couldn't keep it up. And you end up weeping bitterly. If you establish your identity in the flesh, whether it's through your career success, your academic performance, the possessions and the lifestyle that you flaunt, the way you dress and look, the people who follow you on social media, the relationship uh, with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, the, 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 the family that you're raising, the ch lovely children that you have, all these things, you know something? All these things stop being good things. They stop being enjoyable things. They become a pressure cooker in which you're trapped. The anxiety of having keep up all these things robs you of the joy they ought to bring into your life as good gifts of God. You find it harder and harder to manage them well because now the stakes are so high. It's choking. If you rely on something you work for to give you an identity and you fail to keep it up, you become nobody. You'll be forgettable. You'll be insignificant. And that's crushing. And that is what society, that's what our culture is selling us. And it doesn't work. We need something better. So let's go to point three. Number three, the provision of a better identity. Now Paul explained that he used to put his confidence, he used to ground his identity in, uh, in the flesh, right? Put his confidence in the flesh by his efforts, and he did it better than everybody else. He had a gold-plated resume, but now, one day, he experienced something so much better that in comparison, the gold-plated resume was as good as garbage, rubbish. Okay, let's see what he says again. Philippians 3, verses 7 to 9. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. For the sake of Christ, what is more, I consider everything a loss. That go play the resume because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. It's a polite translation. In Greek, it literally says dung, crap. I consider them crap that I may gain Christ. And be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. What is he saying here? Paul is saying, I have now a newfound identity, a vastly superior one. What's the difference? 
Okay, this may not seem like very relevant to you, but the difference is that this identity is received rather than achieved. Okay, it's a different, totally different kind of identity because it's an identity that is received rather than achieved. The old identity was based on works. The new identity was based on faith, believing, putting your trust in Christ. It is freely, it's, it's given as a matter of grace. It is given freely to all their faith, meaning who put their trust in Jesus Christ, that He went to the cross to die for our sins. I said just now, why is this important? How, how does it apply to us, especially those of us who are not yet believers? Now I said just now that we all need approval. We need more than just our own approval of ourselves. We need external validation, but not just any external validation, but the validation of the people who matter. How many times have you gone to somebody's office, somebody's home, and they have a framed picture of themselves shaking hands with the president or some important person? You know, I also shake hands with a lot of people, you know. How come they don't frame a photo of me shaking hands with them? They put it in the office, put it on the wall. Why not? Reason is simple. We don't just long to be approved. We long to be approved by people who matter. People whose opinion matter. People who are important. And that's why Paul says this identity is far superior. Because when he trusted in Christ, he received the righteousness that comes from none other than God, creator, master, king of the universe. If you understand this, guys, it will blow your mind. I was just worshipping up there just now. A few thoughts just came to my mind that, look, here we are worshipping God in such a casual manner. But we don't understand, maybe, that we are coming before the great king. You know, you read the Old Testament. What are kings like? You have Esther. She wanted to enter into the king's chambers, huh? his throne room to make a request of him to save her people. She was asked to do that. And she said, you know, anybody who comes into the king's presence without being summoned, the penalty is death. That's what you deserve. Unless the king summons you, you don't get the privilege of coming into his presence. Right? You think about Nehemiah. One day he appeared before the king, who was cupbearer, the king, he served the king. And the king asked him, hey, why are you blackface me? Ah? Huh? That's all the king said. And he said, I was very afraid because that is deserving of death. Yeah? If the king is supposed to be such a great person. We come into his presence, supposed to leap with joy, not show him that you're sad. Okay, you bury your sadness and do your work and you know, just serve him with gladness. That's what kings are like. But here we have freedom to come into the king's presence because this is a different kind of king. He doesn't say, come to my presence, and he I kill you. Instead, he went out his way. Although he was king, he came and died for us. He's the king who invites us to draw near, not because we're worthy, but because he paid the price for our sins. God is perfect, supreme, and sovereign being. When you trust in Christ, God counts your sins against Christ. And he credits you with Christ's righteousness in exchange. That's what Paul is saying. No, I used to try and earn my own righteousness so that I can be approved. Now I freely received it. I have a righteousness that comes from God that is by faith. And since Christ is the perfect Son of God, now God approves of you as if you have perfect righteousness. He joyfully receives you because now He sees you as being totally holy, Blameless, beautiful, lovable. That is how He sees you. That is the new identity that you can receive. You know, we used to question, we used to have membership interviews. In those days, it was very hard to become a member of the church. You, you could go for four long lessons and then four days of lessons and then you had to be interviewed by the church council. And one of the questions we always asked applicant was this. On a scale of one to ten, yeah, one means not approved at all, 10 means perfect approval. How righteous do you think you are before God? 
How righteous does he see you as? On scale one to ten. It's very interesting to listen to the answers. Some of them very humble. They say, mm, I think about four, five. You no, know, I still got a lot of uh, issues in my life. And then there are some a lot more confident. I think about maybe seven, eight. In all my years of interviewing people, I never heard anyone gone above eight. You know, because they say, well, oh, better not claim to be perfect. Right? And then we'll tell them, your answer is wrong. Okay, because God in Christ sees you as a perfect 10. Tell the person next to you, yeah, perfect 10. And that's not, don't take my word for it. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him Jesus who, knew no sin, who had no sin to be seen for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Tell the person next to you, righteousness of God. You don't just have any kind of righteousness, now you have the righteousness of God. So if you trust in Christ, God sees you. God relates to you as a perfect, lovable, blameless, beautiful being. Isn't that what all of us want to be in all the things we're trying to do, the way we dress, the things we buy, the gadgets we use, the house we live in, the cars we drive, the job we do, the amount of things we want to accumulate, the way we talk, impress people? You already have it. It's received, not achieved. And then you can tell people that you're perfect 10, their eyes will always light up. Ding, ding. It's something new. You see, all our lives, we're trying to get people to approve of us, think well of us, be impressed by us, like us, especially the people who matter. Actually, what we really need for our identity is the Creator's approval, the King's approval, which we have forfeited by our sin. So we try to make up for that with human approval, but that's a poor substitute. It will never satisfy. You create lots of stress in your life. So Christianity is good news. Hallelujah. It tells us that we can have this complete approval of God if we trust in Christ's sacrifice, not in our own efforts, by faith, not in the flesh. The more we understand that, the more we receive that in our lives, the less we will heck care about human approval or the lack of it. We have the approval of the king. Who cares what people think of me? Now you can really say that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, very important. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't just let culture squeeze you in its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, because we have this deep need in our hearts, we need to have this identity, this deep need in our hearts to be approved to be somebody, to be significant, it will drive us inevitably to conform to the pattern of this world, to strive for an achieved identity. It doesn't matter whether you live 200 years ago or live today. That is the trajectory of our lives without Christ. We will, it's invariable. You will do that. You will have an identity. You try to establish an identity that's achieved. It is only by God's mercy that you can begin to have a received identity. And unlike human approval, God's approval will never be lost because you didn't work to get it in the first place. It's freely received by grace. You see, if you have to work for something, you can always lose it once you don't keep up, once you don't match up, once you stop you know, achieving it. But Christ paid for our sins in full, which means... The identity we have is eternally secure. It can never be lost because it does not depend on us. It depends on Christ. One more thing. Having a received identity will mean that now you view other people in a whole new way as well. If your identity is received, you will invariably look down on those who are not as accomplished as you based on the criteria that you apply to establish your identity. You know, if you believe that making lots of money is a measure of brilliance and worth, then it must logically and necessarily follow that those who are making less money than you are stupider and worthless than you. 
You may not put it that way, you may not admit it to yourself, but if that is what you use to establish your identity, there is no way to escape that conclusion. If you believe that being very moral, being very char charitable, being very religiously pious is what gives people real worth, then inevitably you have to consider immoral people, godless people, irreligious people, uncharitable people as bad people, or at least not as good as you. And that's why you find that people who, who tie their whole identity to some cause, with, you know, something that they, they really live for, believe in, something that they advocate, whether it's the environment, whether it's uh, LGBT rights, whether it's racial equality, almost invariably, they will despise and they will cancel the people who don't agree with their views. Why? Because an achieved identity makes you arrogant and dismissive of other people who are not, not as accomplished as, as you. In contrast, when you have received identity, you will be humble yet confident. You'll be humble because you know that you're no better than anyone else. In fact, honestly, as Christians, those of us who are Christians, we come across a lot of Christians who are morally superior to us. They are more honest. <laughs> they, they observe higher standards of integrity. They, lead, they have more self-control in their lives. And that's all right. That's all right because we recognize that it's not what saves us. What saves us is grace. Not because we're better than these people that God accepted us. And that humbles us. You receive God's righteousness purely by grace. You will live with, on, on the other hand, you live with great confidence because you know that God accepts you perfectly and loves you to the skies to the extent that you gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And when you understand you're loved in that way, nothing in this life can shake you. You can have the worst day of your life and it will not shake your confidence. You can face the greatest challenge you have ever faced in your life and you'll be able, you know, to ride through that confidently when you have an identity that is received, not achieved. Now we saw how Peter's identity, his self-concept crushed him because he could not live up to it. But not long after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, we see a Peter that is so transformed he's almost unrecognizable. Huh? Acts chapter 5, verse 28. This is the high priest talking. We gave you strict instructions, orders not to teach in this name. He said, Yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. What's he saying? He's saying, you dare accuse us. Uh. You dare accuse us of being corrupt, or abusing our power, or plotting the murder of innocent men? What would the old Peter have done? Run away. Deny it. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I was so stupid. I said the wrong thing. I didn't mean that at all. Instead, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings, rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. Yes, you did it. You plotted murder, you abused your power, you killed an innocent man. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and wondered to put them to death. And Peter and the rest of the gang they said all this knowing that they're putting their lives on the line. That same cowardly fellow is now standing before the same authorities who framed and killed Jesus. But he's no longer the same person. He has a new found identity. He went through an identity crisis and on the other side of the crisis, he came out now he has a new found identity. He's no longer a squeaky, timid mouse. Now he is a bold, fearless, roaring lion. What happened? Well, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared personally to Peter to restore him, to re-establish relationship with Peter, to let him know that he was fully forgiven, freely forgiven, fully loved and approved, and he appointed Peter as the leader of the gang. After you have failed me, you know, after you make all those declarations and failed me, I nevertheless want you to go back and take care of my brothers, take care of the other disciples. Jesus treated him as if he had never failed him, never said those stupid things, never betrayed him. 
because all those were paid for on the cross by Jesus Christ. And what we have now is a new identity, not achieved, but received the perfection of God, the righteousness of God. And you know something? Jesus wants to do the same for every one of you today. He wants to offer you a better identity. One that is neither based on fulfilling the obligations the others place on you, nor by expressing yourself as an individual to gain the approval and sense of worth that you crave. No, 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 no. All those are real needs, but He's going to meet the, those needs in a better way. A way that does not involve self-deception. A way that does not produce lots of anxiety and mental issues. He wants to give you His perfection. He wants you to know who you really are. A child of God. Loved, cherished, protected, Like what we sing, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when you cannot see it, God is at work in us. He has a plan for our lives. And it is a good plan. That is our identity. We, have been, we now identify the perfection of Christ. We now identify Christ as the child of God. A child with whom the Father, the King of the universe is well pleased. Isn't that a far better way to see yourself, live your life, relate to other people than whatever the world offers you? How can you have that? Now all you do is confess your sins, you've sinned and cut yourself off from God. And then trust in Jesus to qualify you for God's approval, approval that is completely, that is complete and completely secure. Now some of you are believers. Christians. And remember what I said just now. It's entirely possible. Come to church, grow up in church 14 years, 15 years, 20 years, go to Sunday school, go to youth group, go to young adults, come here as an adult, listen to all those truths, receive them intellectually, but never develop a Christian identity. Because all you have done, you've allowed yourself to be programmed by the world. Culturally, your identity, I mean, your identity is really culturally conditioned. You are still trying to live up, some of us, you are still trying to live up to our parents' approval, to fit into that system, to live up to those expectations, to conform and hope that by conforming, you know, people will approve of us. But more and more, the rest of us, we want to do the opposite. We want to break the mold. We want to get off the trodden path. We want to do our own thing. At least that's our dreams. And we think that by doing that, we will be approved, we'll be admired, we'll be popular, we'll be somebody, we'll think better of ourselves. We still have essentially a non-Christian identity. Now today, I hope as you hear this message, you recognize that, that the Holy Spirit will convict you in your heart. Just think about the things you're anxious about. Why do you get so uptight? over the bad things that happen in your life, the deadlines they've meet, the assignments that you have to submit at work or in school. Why do you get so bothered by the bad things people say about you, the rejection that you experience? Because you're still living with an achieved identity, not a received identity. Today, why don't you just come before God and receive what He freely, freely offers to you? the righteousness of Christ that you is given to you as a matter of grace. Not because you perform, but because Christ performed. And we take on that righteousness. When you understand that righteousness, you experience the approval of God in your life, the pleasure of God in your life. God is your heavenly Father looking down at you with great pleasure his heart is overflowing with love for you. He wants the best for you. He doesn't think that you are you know, some hopeless fellow, you know, living in sin, and you know, he doesn't reject you. 
He wants to make you into the kind of person you were meant to be. He will provide for you. He will give you a better plan than you have for yourself. Won't you come to Him today and receive that new identity? You've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wow, all this must be mind-blowing to you. Right? You know, think Christianity ah, is just new philosophy, different philosophy, one of those religions, set of rules. You know, if Christianity is like that, then in order to be saved by God, you need to work hard, obey all the rules, do all the right things. And it goes back to the old achieved identity. No, Christianity offers you something far more superior. It says, take it, it's free. It's free for you because the Son of God is everything. But when you have that in your life, it answers the most fundamental questions of life. It meets the deepest needs in your life. Now you have the approval of the King. And it humbles you and helps you go out there and live with confidence and it teaches you to relate to other people with love. Okay? And this, that's what... Uh, let's, let's just bow our heads, look to the Lord in prayer. Let's just pray for those of us who are believers first. Maybe as you hear the message today, you recognize that you do have an identity crisis. You are a Christian, a child of God. You might have been dead for the last 20 years. You might have been born in a Christian family and you never knew anything else. But in your heart of hearts, you are filled with anxiety. You are still trying to keep up, to match up. You are looking for approval. You are filled with fear. When you do badly, you are crushed. When you do well, you are anxious. You feel aimless and bored in life. If that's where you are. Today, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, stop trying to establish your own identity according to the rules of the world. You can't play that game. Come to Jesus. Come back to the cross. Come back and receive the grace of God. Thank God that you are His child. You are loved. You are loved more than you can ever understand, although you are more sinful than you could have ever imagined. Live in that. Walk in that. Rejoice in it. Enjoy the love of God and go and relate to other people with this newfound identity. Don't be a squeaky, timid mice. Be a roaring, fearless lion. We must obey God rather than man because we have the approval of the King. It doesn't matter what people think of me. What matters is what God thinks of me and He thinks the world of me.